Great question here. Uh, this one's from John, um, and he says, how do I know when to use regular red bricks versus fire bricks versus ceramic fiberboard insulation versus uh, ceramic wool insulation? And I thought that was a great question because, you know, for some of us who have built a lot of stoves, it's going to be sort of second nature. But I understand that when you're coming at it cold, you're going to be saying, geez, how can I look at all these materials? Which one goes where? So I th it really, I thought it was great. And it's um, a great to be great to talk about that, you know, and the features and functions behind them. Um, so Jeremiah says, uh, maybe they see me as a scavenger out for their scraps and nuisance. <laughs> Material suppliers are the same. Most times I break out the phone and begin the unasked for lesson. Yeah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah is referring to uh, talk, walking in the stove shops and having them, you know, maybe see him as a scavenger. And that's why, you know, we're disappointed in them. Um, but yeah, material suppliers are the same. You know, one of the things about calling material suppliers is that's interesting is, um, if you tell them what you're going to use the materials for, they're often going to try and talk you out of it, which I think is what you're referring to, Jeremiah. You know, they'll say, oh, ceramic fiberboard, fiberboard you can't put it in direct flame. Um, or uh, rise your sleeves, uh, can't take direct flame. Those are some of the common ones that I get. And it's because of the way they use them in their industrial applications. And they can only envision sort of these giant boilers uh, using these materials. And so they often get spooked by sort of what you know what we're going to use the materials for but that is a great segue into that question about the different types of bricks the different types of ceramic fiber and uses and functions so i know we've covered a lot of this before but i'd just like to go over it real basically as you guys know here one of the main functions is going to be is the material high mass or low mass and can it handle high temps or is it going to be damaged by high temps as a low temperature material? And those are really the two deciding factors for any of our materials. Temperature rating, can it handle high temps or does it need to stay low temp? And mass or insulation or insulative quality. quality. Is it high mass? Is it heavy, dense? Or is it low mass, light, weight? And so that really, if you think about those questions, okay, when you're looking at any of the materials in your rocket stove, you should be able to evaluate them and, and understand where they go and why they go where they go. So obviously things that are low mass are, are highly insulated. And we want to use those anywhere where we don't want heat to transfer out or where we want to contain heat and focus heat back into the internals of the stove. So the obvious choice, uh, the obvious location for insulated materials is the core because in the combustion core what do we want to do we want to drive temperature as high as we can in the combustion zone so we want to push heat from combustion we don't want it to soak into the walls and dissipate out through the structure we want it to be contained the heat we want the temperature to be maintained as high as possible. We want to keep those high temperatures in our combustion zone to give us maximum combustion temperature. So with that in mind, we want insulative materials or low mass materials inside the cores. They need to be able to handle high temperatures because the core is going inside the core is going to be one of the highest temperature areas in the stove. Um, and that really does a good job of dictate of, of, illustrating why we're going to use those there. Now we can deal with secondary issues. How durable are they in this location? Are they going to stand up to this? We talked about temperature, but now we've got things like abrasion in the firebox. And you know, these are issues we talk about a lot, but it just kind of gives you a way to look at these materials and, and how you're going to use them. So moving as the as the stove burns, we start to move the hot gases, the hot the, the fuel is combusted, and now the, the hot gases exit the core and they go into whatever the next stage is. Now for our next stage, we might have a radiator, like a metal barrel, a 55 gallon drum, intended to, designed to radiate the heat from those gases into the room. We might have a brick bell, same idea, it's designed to soak up the heat from those gases and radiate them into the room. So in that location, we're going to want something high mass and non-insulated so that the heat can transfer into that material. High mass is ideal, well I said, excuse me, <laughs> high mass would be ideal for thermal storage, something low mass like the barrel 
is a great radiator. The um, steel transfers heat very quickly and effectively, and the low mass moves that heat out away from the barrel, so it radiates into the room, as opposed to red bricks, which, as we know, high mass. Um, but so anywhere where we want, anywhere in the stove body where we want thermal storage and heat transfer, the red bricks are a great choice. Now, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about where we might insulate inside the stove, because that's another part of this question. And it's a, it's a great question. And uh, we talked about using insulated materials in the core, obviously, but where else might we want to maintain high temperatures within the stove? Well, there's a couple locations I can think of. One would be if you're trying to heat water and in a heat exchange chamber. So if you have, for instance, a downdraft chamber that you are going to incorporate a copper heat exchange coil into, that might be a great place to insulate and use insulated materials, whether you use red brick on the outside and then insulate the inside with ceramic fiberboard or ceramic wool. Or you could build that chamber out of insulated brick to keep it low mass and to keep that heat and hot gas is focused on your heat exchanger. Um, so those are just kind of some basics, you know, they're obviously really, really general. Um, but hopefully that gives you kind of some beginnings of understanding of where and when to use those materials. And a secondary question that goes along with that is, can I use ceramic fiber insulation like ceramic wool as a substitute for ceramic fiberboard? And this is another question I get a lot. Ceramic wool is easy to source, uh, usually much easier than ceramic fiber board, and it's usually relatively inexpensive compared to the board. And there are some places where you can use them interchangeably. So in a lot of my builds, I like to use sheets of ceramic fiber board underneath the top caps to allow you to let your riser blast right into, for instance, a concrete top plate or something like that that might not be able to take all the heat. In my plans, I'll often spec ceramic fiberboard as a buffer in between the riser and the top plate. And those are great locations to use ceramic wool if you don't want to spend the money on ceramic fiberboard. So anywhere where you can get the ceramic wool to hold its shape where it doesn't need rigidity, ceramic wool is fine to use. So it's a great place to, it's a great material to use to line a chamber that might be a heat exchange chamber and a great material to use to like line the top that needs protection from heat. So things like that. So, um, and as we know, the ceramic wool is great for our five minute risers. So let me get back to the